Sandy, thank you for the warm welcome. It is so wonderful to be here today with so many friends, colleagues, um, both current and, and former, who I don't get to interact with as often as I would like to. Uh, and uh, it's just great to, um, to be back in Chittenden County and to continue to learn about all the innovations and activities that are going on here and to be sharing in an important statewide agenda for transportation. So today I'm going to be talking about um, our impacts uh, from the recent storms and um, about the importance of the transportation system relative to um, business continuity of operations and things that um, both businesses and um, municipal and state officials need to do as we continue forward with the types of events we experienced this past July and prior events. So um, Irene left over 60,000 homes and businesses in Vermont um, without electricity across the state. It was a very impactful storm. Uh, with the highest concentration of damage in southeastern Vermont. Water shortages also occurred in some communities as public water supplies were contaminated from oil and propane tanks that were washed downstream. We lost 500 miles of state roads, 200 bridges, and more than 60,000 homes and businesses, I mentioned, uh, uh, were without power, but a thousand of those homes were actually destroyed. And to quote former Transportation Secretary Sue Mentor, we, the road builders, the infrastructure builders, really needed to work in concert with and learn from the river scientists. And that was one of the key takeaways from the Irene event. Um, while we had been focalized in that area since the flooding of the mid-90s and had developed a lot of tools and implemented resilience practices, uh, there's still so much more to do. So, <clears throat> It can be hard for one mitigation project to stave off flooding during a storm as severe as the one that hit Vermont this uh, past July. Since Irene, we have adapted all of our transportation infrastructure practices and policies to focus on mitigating risks of failure, in particular from flooding. In coordination with river scientists from ANR and other experts in the field of fluvial geomorphology, the agency developed the Transportation Resilience Planning Tool, which is a web-based application that identifies bridges, culverts, road embankments that are vulnerable to damages from floods, and estimates <coughs> risks based on vulnerability and criticality of roadway segments, and identifies potential mitigation measures based on the factors driving vulnerability. And our Regional Planning Commission's, uh, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, and others across the state were uh, integrally involved in the data collection and the advancement of this tool to be a statewide resource. The, <clears throat> the tool combines river science, hydraulics, and transportation planning methods and is applied at a watershed scale. And the tool has been developed, as I mentioned, for the entire state and is adapted to inform both project scoping at the early planning stages but also capital programming and hazard mitigation planning for state and local highways. We continue to need to be vigilant um, as we understand that disasters are going to strike. While the magnitude may change and the nature of the damage may differ from storm to storm, understanding our vulnerabilities and preparing for these <clears throat> will lessen the impacts when we do experience disasters. And we also are mindful of the fact that flooding is not our only potential disaster, and, and I think we all understand some of the other uh, impacts that we have experienced, in particular through the um, COVID-19 pandemic and how that impacted our day-to-day -day life. So <clears throat> what does this mean? Um, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> We've done a lot of work. We have so much more ahead of us. Um, using the tool and other resources, we can identify vulnerabilities and plan for them. However, transforming a transportation system that has been constructed along historic riparian corridors presents what might appear to be an insurmountable mission given the scale of our transportation system. In addition to our highway network, we have significant 
infrastructure to protect across other areas that impact um, our day-to-day -day travel for business purposes and personal purposes. Fortunately, our federal partners are recognizing that we must invest additional dollars during recovery by upsizing bridges and culverts, which are damaged during a storm, and by making forward investments during everyday maintenance and construction of the existing system. And <clears throat> the system includes um, all of our assets, our trans transit systems, TDM, you know, I think the planning for how the, the uh, CATMA members will be able to, um, to use the transportation system when, when things go awry and how we communicate with folks about that is critically important. Under the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2021, our most recent transportation reauthorization bill, the Promoting Resilient Operations for Transformative, Efficient, and Cost-Saving Transportation, or PROTECT, program was included in the bill. And the agency has just completed the development of our PROTECT plan, uh, which is essentially a hazard mitigation plan, uh, which uh, many of you are familiar with in the room because we've been doing hazard mitigation planning at the state, regional, and local level for, for many years. This federal program um, now will allow us enhanced access to federal funding to incorporate further res resilience into our projects. So this is a boon for, for Vermont. The storms of July of this year once again brought into direct fo focus for all citizens the disaster impacts that we face. While different in nature from tropical storm Irene, the underlying impacts of a concentrated rainfall event, including record-breaking reports in some locations, resulted in many of the same recovery missions that we experienced following Irene. During the July storms, <clears throat> the most impactful failures in the transportation system included slope failures and mudslides, which is a bit different from what we have experienced historically. And our uh, VTrans geotechnical team of engineers, along with consulting engineers, were deployed to hundreds of sites on the state and local highway system to evaluate and plan for the repairs for this type of damage. This storm did impact areas which were impacted by Irene, and we are currently evaluating those sites which were repaired following Irene to determine the level of success our mitigation efforts have yielded. And we have seen in some locations already <clears throat> that while um, the roadway segment, and when you think about a corridor, there were sections that were damaged, we're finding that uh, where we had done um, significant upgrades during Irene, uh, those, those have fared well. So we're very optimistic that we're heading in the right direction. But you can see from the numbers on the slide, um, the scale of, of what we faced in this storm uh, and the magnitude in particular for um, the, uh, the municipalities is quite significant. As we know, it's not just the transportation system which we have to touch during recovery. Our work is closely coordinated with the utilities, with local governments who may have water and wastewater infrastructure concurrent with the highway system or other transportation assets. And so this makes for a very um, complex recovery effort when you think about the scale of um, the, the operations that are happening for utilities, for municipalities, and, and for the state, state itself. As in Irene, our rail system suffered significant impacts as well. After the storm, 58% of all Vermont rail lines were closed. Amtrak service was restored within 10 days. Um, the Ethan Allen restored on July 15th and the Vermonter restored on July 19th. Uh, it was a Herculean effort by the railroads and their contractors with Vermont Rail Systems bringing in a national firm, RJ Corman, to assist with the recovery um, singularly on the Washington County Railroad 
in the Barry Montpelier area. And um, that, that team was with us for over a month and they brought in their equipment, they brought in over 100 employees, and um, they re were able to restore access to the Websterville uh, granite rock um, uh, work area that is a critical source of recovery materials. So um, it's uh, interesting to think about how all of these things are interrelated. In less than a week, we had only 11% of our Vermont rail lines still closed, and it took a total of five weeks to reopen all of the lines. Um, and when you think about the, the scale of the damage that I had on the slide earlier, um, it's kind of hard to believe that um, we could have <laughs> done such, a, such an effort, but um, it's uh, something that's well planned for and something that um, the railroads, the state um, staff, and the contractors all are ready to stand up and respond to on a moment's notice. The recently completed Lamoille Valley Rail Trail uh, was dealt a significant blow with over $10 million in damages. This was um, just one week prior to the, um, the grand opening of the 93 mile trail uh, where the governor had planned to ride the trail from beginning to end, uh, and we were receiving a lot of national and uh, regional press and uh, had a lot of local events that were, we were excited about because the rail trail is really an economic development asset uh, for these rural communities and one that we see as a future sort of backbone of the economy of of the regions that our rail trails run through. And I think you've seen that here in the, the Burlington area, up through the islands. And so we're really excited about um, the, Mile, the Mile Valley Rail Trail completion. And while <coughs> portions have reopened, uh, we continue to work on the most heavily damaged areas between Wolcott Village and the intersections of Route 15 and 215 in Walden and we anticipate having the trail restored for use of all 93 miles by the end of this calendar year. Fortunately for the governor, he took a couple of test rides and he, he has been able to traverse the trail <laughs> end to end um, and uh, he is very excited about um, getting back to uh, where, we, where we may have that uh, celebration again next year. So what can we do? As I mentioned earlier, we identify the vulnerabilities and evaluate the risks. This table from the Vermont State Hazard Mitigation Plan depicts our hazard assessment ranking criteria, frequency of occurrence, basically the probability of a plausibly significant event and the potential impact in terms of severity, extent of damage and disruption to our population, our property, environment and the economy. And when we have a disaster, VTRANS is and the state's first response and focalized responses are to those areas where public health and safety are most at risk. And then we you know, focalize out from there. And when you think about the, the process uh, or the utilization of the transportation system for emergency management purposes, um, that can be uh, a pretty daunting job in terms of the number of high uh, impact locations we need to be to, at in a certain amount of time. The impacts for businesses and citizens of Vermont who rely upon goods and services which <clears throat> require engagement with the transportation system uh, is at the core of meeting our basic needs. In 2018, approximately 40 47 million tons of freight moved into, out from, and through, or within Vermont. <clears throat> and this is from our state freight plan that was recently updated. Trucks carried about 84% of the freight, rail carried about 15%. By 2045, <clears throat> the volume of freight when measured by weight is expected to increase 68% to almost 79 million tons from our current day of 47 million. 
In 2045, rail freight is expected to move a larger share of freight in Vermont as uh, trucking, as businesses um, try to use trucking for environmental purposes to reduce uh, road miles uh, of travel uh, by, by trucks and also um, from a value standpoint. The total value tonnage transported in Vermont within 2018 was approximately 72 billion. And while trucks still account for the majority, 67% in 2018, multiple modes <clears throat> and with rail at 13%, air at 3% and uh, provide a more sizable uh, co contribution. Overall, an approximate doubling in the total value measured in constant 2012 dollars across all modes is expected through 2045 from just under 71 billion to 135 billion. And the rate of growth is close to the projected growth in value of goods moved nationally. It's pretty hard to, to fathom um, and I think our conversations later in the day related to housing and to um, land use are going to be um, things we want to sort of think about scale upon in terms of our, our growth over the next 20 years here in Vermont. So it's not just state infrastructure and operations which are impacted during a disaster. All business operations face impacts and must evaluate risks. There are tools to aid businesses in their risk evaluation and mitigation planning as well as uh, tools for municipalities. The regional planning commissions work closely with municipalities on hazard mitigation and emergency management planning to make sure that they are prepared. These resources can be find, found at the Vermont Emergency Management website. Following Tropical Storm Irene, FEMA hosted a workshop specifically dedicated to business continuity of operations. The agency faced impacts since, between, since Irene, the agency faced impacts from a fire at our former headquarters location at National Life, and this was a few years ago. And we had developed a continuity of operations plan, which we um, had put in uh, place sometime before that, following Irene. Uh, so many state agencies and, and other agencies were disrupted um, with Irene, including the state office facility in Waterbury. So this. Continuity of operations planning for government became a really big focus for the state after that. As with all plans, until you test them, you don't know their shortcomings. In the months following the fire event, our plan was reevaluated. And one of the items we identified as necessary was that every employee whose job required them to use a computer have a laptop that they took home with them every night. This became a key success factor in our ability to respond to the rapid departure from the workplace during the onset of the pandemic. So this is all to say that advanced planning of risks and implementation of mitigation strategies will result in the lessening of impacts following the next disaster, whether you are a private citizen thinking about your own family, um, a business, an organization, or a government, and that um, these, m these activities um, do take time and uh, effort, um, but if we're not going to be in investing in hazard mitigation, we're going to be simply rebuilding the same facilities and going through the same experiences time and time again based on the anticipated disaster profile that we have experienced in the past 40 years and, and, and is anticipated to grow with um, the adjustment of the environment to climate change. So uh, I will close with that and I am happy to take any questions folks may have and we can open it up to a dialogue um, because we, we, are, we have plenty of time for questions and engagement. Thank you. Somebody out there must have experienced something they want to share <laughs> recently <laughs> with, with the July flooding. 
I'm going to put Chapin Spencer on the spot. <laughs> uh, Chapin, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the city of Burlington's um, experience while, while you have more of a sort of week, sometimes a week to week or month to month experience with inundation, rain, uh, and, and the impacts it has on your system. And I'm I, wondering how your team addresses this. Yes, uh, thanks, Michelle. The uh, July storm, we, we handled it well, and we thought we were through it until uh, the wastewater line underneath the Winooski River uh, broke uh, in the midst of the high flood waters of the Winooski River. So while our transportation system uh, survived, and that is a result of a lot of the partnership work we've done to make our infrastructure more resilient, uh, in the 1950s, the practice at the time was to lay our uh, sewer lines uh, underneath the Winooski River, which is a very dynamic uh, location, and uh, 70 years in, we had a break in 2006, and then we had a second break here recently. And so as we build our infrastructure, we are needing to build to another standard than what we inherited, and I think that is all of our challenge moving forward. So. Good news is I signed the contract two days ago to repair that uh, river siphon, and uh, we are going to get it done before winter. So, Excellent. Thank you, Chapin. Yep. Others have examples. I know uh, Green Mountain Transit was one of the organizations during Irene who experienced some significant losses, and I know they were uh, rapidly deploying to um, where buses were stored to make sure that they were out of harm's way. Uh, during this event. Um, are there any transit agencies here that want to talk about what their impacts were during the uh, July events and how that recovery looked or any special engagements th that you had to uh, participate in? I'm going to put Ross on the spot now. I can see him with his hands like... <laughs> and, and Clayton will be here this afternoon. Yeah, from okay, TNT, great. So anyone can catch up with him. As absolutely. And, and I did see that coming. Uh, Thank you. But absolutely, statewide, we did um, have a disparate level of impacts, but I'm happy to say that uh, within a few days, service was reinstituted. Uh, as you know, GMT moved their buses to higher ground. Folks down in the southeast Vermont um, rerouted their routes around the closed uh, uh, thoroughfares and, and roads. And up in RCT, where Johnson was so so badly hit, they stood up emergency services using both our demand response modes as well as implementing a fixed route between Johnson and Morrisville for essential shopping and, and, and services. And so we were part of that in, uh, incident command center and coordinating as best we could and those daily reports to the uh, providers really did allow for them to plan their routes effectively and communicate with their riders. So um, not Irene uh, level, uh, thankfully, uh, but uh, we were in a much better position from the lessons from Irene. I, I, we can certainly say that. Thank you, Ross. You know, I think um, one of the key areas, and um, it's a complex area for us, is uh, we want to take advantage of um, making sure that we are developing the um, the businesses and housing and uh, activities of our uh, citizens and our municipalities in concentrated areas and village centers and downtowns. And um, I know Richard Amori is here from uh, the uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And there's this um, tension between the fact that uh, our river systems uh, tend to be co-located with our village centers and downtowns. And so um, how do we make sure that we are retrofitting, um, that we are selecting sites or hardening to, make, to allow us to continue to utilize those spaces, but to make sure that uh, we're not going to be um, cut off from the resources we need during a disaster. And, it's hard to imagine the scale of, of what that could mean. I think if you look at the uh, city of Montpelier and the city of Barrie, where they are still facing um, issues in terms of some of the state buildings, um, the 
um, the pavilion building, which houses the governor's office and, and several other state agencies, um, the elevator, um, while everything else is, is going and you can actually get there now, um, you know, the, the elevator is still out of service and it's a five-story building. So um, the complexities are always mounting. Um, the Department of Motor Vehicles, they are working right now on their modernization project, which includes um, the ability for citizens and businesses to just use online services to register their vehicles and renew their licenses, et cetera. And that'll be uh, coming online in November in a more robust manner. Some of the things are available now. But, you know, for instance, um, they, they, their building did not experience any significant losses uh, across from the Capitol building in uh, Montpelier, but um, mail service and, and being able to get to the building and um, employees being able to utilize the facility um, became hampered, and that slows down services uh, that we all need. So um, those are some of the... The key things. Oh, good. We have a question or comment in the audience. Hi, Peggy O'Neill, Vermont Clean Cities at UVM's Transportation Research Center. So, um, Michelle, with the state moving towards transportation decarbonization, looking at electrification, what um, what's in the plans to look at how we um, how we mitigate um, some of these climate disasters, um, which probably are caused by burning fossil fuels? But what do we what do we build in um, for the resiliency piece when we have a heavy, um, more heavy duty electric vehicles and mm -hmm. we're relying more on electrification for our transportation sector? That's a great question, Peggy. And I think if we all look to some of the news this past week about Green Mountain Power uh, working to um, make individual households um, more, much more resilient by having power storage on site uh, for their electricity needs for the household, which would hopefully include an electric vehicle. Um, I think w we are going to see um, our utilities going into a more dispersed distribution and storage uh, scenario, both from the fact that uh, we want reliability from that, that <clears throat> electric grid um, as, a, as a basic core need, but also recognizing with more uses coming online uh, that we are going to have to um, have more capacity and that capacity is going to have to be more reliable if we are doing things such as powering our, our transportation network with those resources. So um, we do a lot of coordinated planning along with um, uh, Vermont Ef Energy Efficiency Corporation to um, our Energy Investment Corporation to to make sure that um, as we're planning and developing charging sites as businesses like Green Mountain Transit and other transit agencies who are electrifying their, their fleet um, are making sure that those installations are resilient from the start. But it's a, it's a really important uh, leading edge, yes. So just a, a quick follow-up then. Uh, maybe you know where I'm going on this one. What are we doing about safety training to make sure that not only that we have the facilities that that can support um, this electrification, but also the training? So not just the technicians, but as we deal with a disaster, what are all the pieces um, that we need to put into place uh, to make sure that when we are in a crisis and we're confronting um, an electric vehicle, that all folks or, or emergency responders or, or whatever, have the proper training and the tools to be able to deal with that high voltage systems. Yeah, that's, that's a great one, and I know you are um, heavily involved in that sector, and we are very happy that you are. Um, and I think the federal government is still catching up in terms of um, providing the resources we need to invest in the training that's required. I think we've, got, we've done a great job for communities which have railroads running through them to go into those communities and train their local responders um, for potential events that may occur within their community if there were um, a train derailment or, or some um, incident involving uh, a, a rail situation. So we need to be thinking more broadly and um, 
recognizing that folks may not understand conceptually yet that you um, are going to have to treat your electric vehicle, which may have been impacted by a flood, differently than, or in some ways similarly to um, your internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, so I think there is a lot more to do there. And I think even, you know, we, we are still sort of on the edge of making sure that our um, automotive technicians are trained in um, servicing electric vehicles and uh, making sure that our emergency responders um, understand precautions that they may need to take uh, is an area that um, I think more focus is going to be needed in, in the coming, uh, coming years. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, anybody else? Oh, here's a question here. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Harry Shukai. I'm a student with the Transportation Research Center. Um, I just kind of have a question about um, kind of the resilience of our road networks. I feel like we have a lot, and our trail networks too, I guess, as well. Uh, we have a lot of talk around like our town centers and things being built along river corridors, but a lot of our roads are as well. And, you know, I think a great example of that is Lamoille Valley Rail Trail, which was a huge investment, a wonderful project, but that's a lot of money that's kind of been washed away now. And I'm kind of curious, how is VTrans kind of taking into account the fact that as we continue to develop our transportation network, these climate disasters, we don't expect them to necessarily go away or get better. How is that kind of assessment being taken into account when we spend a lot of money to rebuild and retrofit our road systems? That's a great question. And I think along with the transportation resilience tool that I talked about early in my presentation, you know, we work closely with um, uh, the National Weather Service and the University of Vermont, uh, looking at the hydraulic curves and making sure that when we are designing our projects that we are building in resilience. And um, I think the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail is, I think it's very similar to our conversation about village centers and downtowns that are along rivers. I mean, that's a, that's a rail line, it's along a river. And, um, you know, how, how much hardening can you do um, and still be cost effective? And, and I think we, uh, while that facility was built, I wouldn't say that facility was built to um, a, a, a standard that takes into account all of the impacts we are likely to face based on um, today's um, inundation I think that the, the bridges and culverts, while many of them just weren't able to withstand the magnitude of this storm, that consideration of that and working with our river scientists as we, um, as we des redesign some of those um, approaches is going to be critically important. Uh, I think um, we have done a lot of work uh, with Jim Sullivan at the UVM uh, Transportation Research Center in, in looking at how we can uh, identify those risks and, and make sure that we're addressing them as we go forward. But it, it, it's a huge challenge because um, I think we don't know what we don't know about how we need to plan for this. Um, these are really concentrated rain events that are bringing a scale of inundation that we have never seen before. And um, they're not as predictable as, as what we used to deal with. So that, that's something we're going to have to grapple with as well. All right. How are we doing on time, Sandy? We good? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it.